and welcome to a Word for This Day podcast. I'm Jory Schaefer, the show's host and creator, and it is my joy and pleasure to welcome you today. Welcome back to all you regular listeners. I'm so thankful that you are here, and welcome to anyone who has found us for the first day. It is no accident that you are here today, friends, so please stick around for a bit, and let's see what the Lord has for us as we spend time in His Word today. If you didn't listen yesterday and you were a regular listener, I need to tell you about a mistake that I made. And thankfully, one of the regular listeners let me know and I fixed it. But the um, recording that I had for the 19th of um, September, which was supposed to be Daniel 919, unfortunately, I had had put a duplicate audio file and so there was um the one for psalms uh, from the 18th psalm 918 i originally had for both the 18th and the 19th i just uh, dropped the wrong file in there but i fixed that yesterday so if you listened on the 18th and the 19th and you thought she's put the uh, wrong thing this is a duplicate from yesterday i have now fixed it so the one for daniel 919 is still there And, oh, uh, it is such a good reminder of how we can pray for our our cities, our countries, our nation. And so I would encourage you, if you listen and thought, well, this is just a rerun, it was not intentional, but you can go back and listen now if you uh, if you didn't hear my uh, message about that yesterday. And so I'm sorry about that. In almost a thousand episodes, that's the, the first one that I know of. And it could have been others that people just didn't let me know about, but uh, I'm so sorry about that, but it is fixed. Now, uh, please consider sharing this podcast with your friends, family, neighbors, strangers, just anyone you think may receive a blessing from it. And know that I do love to hear from you. I am so thankful that Donna messaged me and said, did you know that that's the that was a repeat? Uh, I appreciate her reaching out. And please, all of you feel free to do that anytime uh, with the good, the bad, the ugly. I, I appreciate it. I don't want to uh, waste your time. Um, and I want to know if I've done something wrong so that I can fix it. Um, please know that I do continue to pray for you regularly, that the Lord would draw you closer to him and give you more of a desire to know him and to know his word, and that you will be very intentional about spending time with him each day. Well, our verse for the day for the 25th of September of 2024 comes from John's Gospel, John chapter 9, verse 25, and it reads as follows from the Legacy Standard Bible. He then answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Oh, friends, I'm so excited for us to think about this story of the blind man who was healed and what went on after that and um, see what the Lord would have us to know today. Oh, such a good story. And, I, you know, friends, all of us, uh, once we have been saved, have moved from that time of spiritual darkness to spiritual sight when we realize that we are a sinner in need of a Savior and that we've received the Lord Jesus. Uh, we may not have been physically blind, uh, but he removes that spiritual blindness, and aren't we thankful? Well, uh, first of all, you know that if you've been on this journey with me for very long, I think it's very wise for us to think about where we are in the Scripture, who may have written the book or letter that we find ourselves in, uh, what was going on, what was the context, um, and that helps us to understand it, to remember it, to recall it, to, sh- to share it, to apply it. It is so important to get the context, and so let's do that now. We know that we are in the New Testament, and we're in the Gospel of John. The New Testament begins with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and those were written by Uh, Four different men from four different writing styles, from four different backgrounds with four different writing styles. And I love that the Lord 
uh, the Lord God the Father uh, chose these different men to write these because uh, when we put these all together and begin to look at them together, you can get more details, more information about Jesus' time here on earth. That word gospel means good news, and these do tell us the good news of Jesus' earthly ministry. Oh, and friends, it is such good news that he was sent by the Father to come to walk on this earth, and he walked a completely sinless life. Um, he was tempted in every way as we are, yet was it was without sin, as we read in Hebrews. And he uh, did that so that he could be that perfect sacrifice, that one time for all sacrifice. And what was he sacrificing for? Well, all of us are sinners. And sin, the wages of sin, what is earned by sin is death. And uh, the sin that we have in our lives is against a holy God. And we can't be in his presence. We can't be in relationship with him if sin separates us from him. And so he made a way for that sin to be paid for. And that was in Jesus. Jesus laid down his life, paid the penalty that all of us owed for our sins against a holy God. He did it by shedding his blood on that cross. And he was placed on that cross. And then after he died, he was placed in the tomb and he was there um, buried. And then on the third day, he was resurrected in full bodily form. He was seen by many, and then he ascended back to heaven. That was witnessed, and he's seated at the right hand of God, and he's coming again. That is the good news. The good news is that not only did Jesus pay the price that we owed before we were, we were ever born, before those of us who are listening right now ever came to be, Jesus paid that price for us. We just have to accept it and follow him. And... Uh, he did that, and not only did he uh, pay for the sin, but he defeated death and hell and sin and the grave. And so it would have been enough. It would have been such a blessing for us to save us from hell. But not only did he do that, he made a way that we could have life eternal if we believe in him, that we could, after this very short life, which is just but a vapor, as we read in James's letter, um, we can have eternity with him where there's no sorrow, no sickness, no pain, no death. And oh, friends, I'm looking forward to that day. I'm thankful for the time that we have here. Um, but when the Lord sees fit for us to be in eternity, I'm very much looking forward to that as well. And so these gospels tell us about that. They were written um, by the these four different men as we mentioned with four different original audiences, although we know that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness. So even though these original words were had, uh, you know, the early audiences, they're for us. God has graciously allowed us to have these words, and we mustn't take that for granted because there's parts of the world and perhaps some people who are listening because people do listen all over the world uh, where it is uh, not legal for them to have the word or to study the word out in open in the open. And so um, I'm so thankful that he would love us so that he would make a way for us to have this. Um, we know that the Gospels were written, uh, two of the men were in that original apostle group and two uh, were not in that original apostle group. Matthew and John were, Luke and Mark got their information from the men who were in the original apostle group, but they weren't original apostles. Um, John is thought to have been the youngest of the apostles. He's also known as John the gospel writer, John the revelator, John the apostle. Um, he describes himself as the elder in his letters of first and second, I think, and maybe third John, or maybe it's second and third John. Um, but he describes himself as that he was the longest surviving of the apostles. And, uh, 
we know that all of the others uh, died a martyr's death except for uh, Judas Iscariot, who hanged himself. Uh, but all the other apostles died um, because they were followers of the Lord Jesus. And then it is thought that John, this revelator, John the Apostle, died um, of an old age. Um, he was cast out on the Isle of Patmos. He uh, wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then the book of Revelation. He and his brother James were fishermen, and they were working with their father Zebedee when the Lord Jesus called them. And uh, John described himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And I've told you this before. I don't think this was because he was being arrogant. I think he began to realize the depth of God's love for him and Jesus's love for him and knowing what Jesus had done and laying down his life for him. We know that uh, when Jesus was hanging on the cross that uh, John, the, this writer of this gospel, was at the foot of the cross, as was Jesus's mother, Mary. And John and Jesus looked to John and said, woman, I'm sorry, looked to Mary and said, woman, here is your son. And to John and said, here is your mother. And uh, the scripture records that John took Mary home and took care of her after that. And so there was a very close bond there. John, along with Peter and James, were in that uh, very close inner circle of apostles with the Lord Jesus. And um, we see that John's writing style in his gospel is different than the writing style of Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospels. Uh, we do not see the parables in John's gospel um, but I love it. I love it when we're in the gospel. Of course, you know, I love all of the words and all of the verses, but, uh, there's just such wonderful imagery here. I love the way the Holy Spirit inspired John to write these things. Um, and so John goes back all the way to the beginning of time, uh, all the way to the beginning of creation at the beginning of his gospel. And he says, uh, as we've talked about several times, but it's just so important to remember. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. I just love that. And then John uh, reminds us that that word, who is Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and then he starts to tell us about John the Baptist, who was the one who was that forerunner of the Lord Jesus. We hear about... Um, Jesus coming to John the Baptist to be baptized and John realizing John the Baptist, who is different than John, this gospel writer, realizing that this was the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And then in chapter two, we see uh, Jesus performing a miracle at the wedding at Cana where he turned water into wine. Um, and we begin to see Jesus interact with um, more of the people. We see that the fair, one of the Pharisees, Nicodemus, came to Jesus at night, and uh, Jesus told him uh, about being born again and what that meant. And um, we see that Jesus had that interaction with the Samaritan woman and knew about her life, and because of what he told her, uh, she went and told others about Jesus, and many people, uh, we read in the scripture, believed because of her telling of what Jesus had done for her, and I love that. It's such a wonderful example, even though um, she had had such a, a difficult life and had had uh, things that it, she likely regretted or that things that she couldn't change um, because of her interaction with Jesus, she told others about Jesus, and many believed. 
And then we start to see in chapter five the the tables and well not the tables the tide begins to turn a little because Jesus is telling people that they can be forgiven for their sins and he does it. Um, that caused a great deal of uh, backlash from the religious leaders because they. They rightly knew that no one could forgive sins but God alone, but they could not wrap their mind around the fact that Jesus was equal with God, that he was God's son, that he had come to this earth in human form. They just couldn't think that he could be the Messiah, the son of God, the one that they had been looking for. And so we start to see that pushback from the Pharisees and the religious leaders and um, then we begin to see more of Jesus's miracles where he feeds the 5,000 and he walks on the water and um, he starts to uh, have those uh, interactions more with the religious leaders and really calling out what uh, they believe and how that is not in accordance with how God intended things. And so as we get to this chapter 9, um, there's going to be a big uh, hoopla, we should say, because Jesus is going to uh, heal someone and he's going to do it on the Sabbath. Um, and uh, the Pharisees couldn't look at what a wonderful thing, how how Jesus had made this man whole. Uh, all they could think about was that he... Uh, broke what they considered were uh, rules that should never be broken in uh, making this man whole on God's holy day. And so um, let's pick up and go, let's see, I'm going to read uh, starting at the beginning of chapter 9 so you get this picture and then we'll read forward to our verse for the day. So if we pick up in chapter 9 verse 1 it says in As he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this was so that the works of God might be manifested in him. That is huge. That I've just got to pause there. That was the purpose of all of this, and so that it would bring to uh, the forefront the you know what the Pharisees thought and God's uh, goodness and His grace and His mercy and all these things. I just love that. Um, but then Jesus says in, cha- in chapter nine, verse four, "We must work the works of Him who sent me as long as it is day." Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And friends, I've got to pause right there. Think about what that means, that the light of the world gives sight. He shined light into the darkness, into the dark hearts, into the physically dark. And so um, we could spend hours on each one of these verses, but I just I couldn't uh, pass by that. It says, when he had said this, he spat on the ground, made clay. Of the, of the saliva and rubbed the clay on his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated scent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, Is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, This is he. Still others were saying, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I'm the one. So the one who had received his sight was like, listen, guys, I really couldn't see, but now I can. Um, And in verse 10, it says, so they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? He answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and rubbed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So when I went away and washed, I received sight. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was the Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, He applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. So then some of the Pharisees were saying, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a sinful man do such signs? And there was a division among them. Therefore they said, 
to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. Then the Jews did not believe it of him that he was blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? So his parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. Therefore, a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And then here's our verse for the day. He then, so that the man who had been born blind, who had received his sight, it says, He then answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And there's more to this, um, and we will, Lord willing, get into that um, in a couple of days when we do another verse here, if the Lord allows. Um, But I wanted you to hear what was going on. Jesus was walking along. He uh, saw a man blind from birth. He healed the man blind from birth, and All the people in the community knew that this man was blind, Um, and when he was healed, some were arguing, well, that's not really the guy, and some were like, yeah, it is, and all this time he was saying, I'm the one, and they were ignoring that, and then the Pharisees um, were very frustrated just because Jesus did this on the Sabbath. And they had um, self-imposed a lot of additional regulations about what could be done, like how how many steps you could take on the Sabbath, what all you could do um, on the Sabbath. And that was not the intent of God's law. The intent was uh, for people to rest and uh, to uh, rejuvenate because God had rested, but it wasn't that they were to have these strict rules that they imposed on everyone, and um, their heart was wrong behind that. But uh, they were looking to find fault with Jesus, and even though they could see and they had proof uh, based on all these eyewitness accounts that this man had been born blind, they still questioned his parents. They questioned him more than once. Uh, They put him out of the synagogue, we're going to see later. And they accused Jesus of being a sinner because he healed a man on the Sabbath, because he made a man whole, because he gave sight on the Sabbath. And um, they told this man they uh, when it, they made him come to them a second time. Um, they wanted him to confess that Jesus was a sinner, even after others in their own group could said, um, you know, a sinful man could not do these things that only God could do. Um, but they just kept pushing because they did not think that Jesus fit into their box of what they thought the Messiah would be or who the Christ would look would be. Um, And this man, even though all these religious leaders were coming against him, said um, in our verse, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. He was going by what he had lived through once Jesus touched him. And that's important for us to remember, friends. We can tell our story. We can witness to our God, the way that our God has changed our heart, the way that he has changed our mind, the way that he has set us free from sin. Some are going to believe it. Some are going to continue in skepticism. It is not up to us to convince them. If we're asked, we need to give the reason for the hope that we have. Um, And we do need to tell people what Jesus has done. We do need to say, look what he's done in my life. But if they don't believe, 
it's not up to us to worry about convincing them. We don't have to beat them over the head with it. We could just continue on. If they choose to, to continue in their unbelief, that's between them and the Father. Um, that's hard to do. But what we must realize is if they reject God's child, if they reject of what God has done in our life, it's not us that they're rejecting. It is it is God. It is his son that they're rejecting. And so this is just a good example. Now, we know, you and I know, because the scripture is very clear that Jesus did not sin. He was completely without sin. Um, he was tempted in every way as we are, yet was with, without sin. He was that perfect, sinless sacrifice. That's why it was perfect. He was the Lamb of God, that spotless Lamb of God, the one that's talked about in Isaiah 53. And even in Isaiah's prophecy, so we're talking 700 years before, um, we uh, read about that one who would come to give sight to the blind and to that uh, that would help the lame walk and um, provide liberty for the captives, all those things. And Jesus was doing that. These Pharisees should have been able to see that he was fulfilling all of these prophecies, but they were so blinded by um, what they presumed to be their own authority, and they were so blinded by unbelief um, that they just refused to yield. And so that comes down to all of us. Are we going to refuse and rebel? Or are we going to believe? And we cannot worry if those around us don't believe. We can tell our story and then we continue on and Jesus will be with us even when the world is not. And so I just want to encourage you in that. You know, um, some of us, it, it, it really tears at our heart if if we we know the truth and we want others to know the truth, but they just refuse, and what we must remember is that's God's department. You know, we can share, we can witness, we can tell the truth, and what people do with it is between them and God. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't share the truth. So we still shine that light. We still give God the glory. We still try to point people to him. But we mustn't take it on ourselves and think that we have failed if they don't believe. Um, that's between them and God. So be encouraged. Keep telling your story. Testify to what he has done. And may he receive the glory. Blessings to you, friends. Until next time.